My name is Joseph Mutcher and I'm a paediatric gastroenterology doctor in London. Welcome to our audiovisual presentation of our poster from Pespagan Conference 2024 on Clostridioides difficile and paediatric IBD, or C. diff. Now you may well recognise some of the elements on this slide from our poster presentation of Pespagan Conference 2024 if you got here via the QR code on the poster. But if you didn't and you got here some other way, we hope you enjoy the presentation. Why is this important? Well, C. diff is a spore-forming, toxin-producing, gram-positive anaerobe and one of the most common causes of hospital-acquired and antibiotic-associated infectious diarrhoea. The, e the estimated asymptomatic carriage rate of C. diff is around 5% in adults and between 15-70% to in infants. Patients with IBD are thought to have a higher prevalence of C. diff colonisation and C. diff-associated disease than the general population, with associated worse outcomes. Now, C. diff-associated disease is what we look out for as paediatric gastroenterologists and is characterised by diarrhoea, abdominal pain, rectal bleeding, fever, macroscopically pseudomembranous colitis on colonoscopy, and in extreme cases, toxic megacolon, and in some cases, death. The pathogenesis of, of C. diff-associated disease includes GI dysbiosis, leading to C. difficile overgrowth, and, and in turn the release of two clinically significant exotoxins, C. diff toxins A and B. Now that will become relevant in, in a bit. Risk factors for C. diff associated disease include antibiotic use, specifically fluoroquinolones, GI surgery, IBD that we've mentioned, immunosuppression and gastric acid suppression, such as with proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole. The aim of our study was to ascertain the prevalence of C. difficile carriage and associ associated disease in the East London paediatric population, looking at rates of C. diff colonisation and active disease in children with IBD versus other groups. We wanted to test the hypothesis that the rate of C. difficile carriage and associated disease are higher in IBD. So how did we do that? We performed a retrospective analysis of all paediatric C. difficile test requests sent to the microbiology laboratory at Bart's Health NHS Trust between the 12th of April 2020 to the 6th of November 2022, and we statistically analysed the results using Fisher's exact test. Now I mentioned previously that we will talk again about C. difficile toxin A and B, and that's important as we talk through this slide, which is the interpretation of C. difficile testing, which can sometimes be a little bit confusing if it's not something you deal with frequently. So there are three tests that our laboratory uses for C. difficile testing. The first is C. difficile glutamate dehydrogenase, also known as GDH. What this test means is if it is present in the stool, it means that the individual is colonised with C. difficile. And that can be in active disease, so toxigenic disease or non-toxigenic infection. And whether or not you treat these patients for C. difficile depends on whether or not they have exotoxin A and or B present in their stool too. So, the next test is for that, C. difficile exotoxins A and B. The presence of either of these exotoxins, or both, indicates actively producing C. difficile toxins, which means they have active disease which requires treatment, if they have relevant symptoms. The third test that our laboratory does is C. difficile toxigenic gene PCR. Now, if this is positive, it shows that the patient is not only colonised, with C. difficile, but that they are colonised with a transmissible C. diff strain that is capable of exotoxin production. If they are asymptomatic with this test being positive, it doesn't usually require treatment. But of course, clinical correlation is advised and we should treat every patient on their own merits with their own test results. So, what did we find? Well, 601 C. diff samples were received by our laboratory, and our study included 470 of them for analysis, which represented 334 unique patients and clinical encounters. We only included patients aged above one year, and the upper limit of age for our group was 15 years. The mean age was 8.5 years. 63% of patients were male. 13% of patients had a diagnosis of Crohn's disease, and 16.8% had a diagnosis of ulcerative colitis. 2.1% had a diagnosis of IBDU, and 157 which is 47% of the patients, had no specified background diagnosis. So what did we find in the tests themselves? So interestingly, the 
rate of C. difficile colonization, so those being GDH positive, was actually significantly higher in the non-IBD group than the IBD group in our study, with 20% in the non-IBD group versus 7.7% in the IBD group. And that was a statistically significant difference. However, there wasn't any statistically significant difference when comparing the non-IBD and IBD groups when looking at rates of active disease and toxigenic gene presence. We then did further analysis, excluding patients with an oncological diagnosis because they also, or intestinal failure because they both also have additional risk factors. And there was no change in the significance of the results I just mentioned. So here's a graph that shows the rates of positivity between the different groups. And as you can see, the GDH is much higher in terms of positive findings in the non-IBD group with statistical significance. So, what does this mean? Well, our results suggest that there's a statistically significant higher rate of C. diff colonization in the general population than there is in our IBD population. This contrasts with previous studies demonstrating the reverse. Reasons for this could include stringent antibiotic stewardship policies that are embraced in our trust, thus avoiding some of the dysbiosis that contributes to colonization. Other factors may also include genetic or microbiomic variability in the East London population. However, the equivocal rates of C. diff associated disease and presence of toxigenic gene material seen between the two, the two groups, the IBD group and the non-IBD group, suggest that patients with IBD in our population are actually overrepresented in terms of their comparatively low rate of colonization translating into clinically relevant disease. Reasons for this may include an increased use of immunosuppressive drugs in this group, increased use of proton pump inhibitors, which are often co-prescribed with corticosteroids, which is a mainstay of IBD treatment, or microbiomic and mucosal permeability differences in this population. We suggest that the risk of C. diff-associated disease should be borne in mind when counselling these patients on the sequelae of IBD and the risks of antibiotic treatment. Thank you very much for listening this far, and we hope to see you around at the Spagan Conference 2024. Thank you.